Hello folks, today in my second video I will talk more about Mustafa Kemal Atatürk's religious beliefs and more precisely about his ideological views regarding religion in society and his interpretation of modernity. Now before I go on, I'd like to make clear that considering the cultism regarding Atatürk in Turkey, any kind of research, let alone decent discussions, are usually very difficult to have. Whatever you mention either will offend one group, and whatever you do not say will offend the other one. Without going into much depth regarding this, in the eyes of many if not most Turks, Atatürk is often simplified to a nationalistic leader who was only against some backward mullahs and imperialist backed separatists. Asking second questions regarding this is either considered blasphemy and often will get you the regular accusations where they will question your Turkishness or ideological motives. Are you an Islamist, reactionary, wannabe Arab, liberal traitor, a PKK supporter, you name it. By this time you will also have noticed that I disabled the like dislike button as I am pretty confident that this video will be primarily disliked by dominantly Turkish nationalists. Another reason for mentioning this is that a portion of Atatürk's personal writings is not even published by the state archives and remains still under lock. As for those which are available, you'll often require special permission to look into them. Again, this is another example of how Turkish politics is used to pollute historical discussion. Having mentioned those things, we can finally start with the video. When we want to achieve an objective understanding of Atatürk's personal beliefs, we'll have to first let loose that Atatürk was not an inventor, but rather a product of his era. After all, he was first a soldier, then a politician, and then perhaps an intellectual who busied himself with intellectual questions on what modernity entails or the role of religion in society. However, as we will see, these were rarely his own ideas, but rather the ideas of late Ottoman intellectuals and certain Western thinkers, as again, it was a product of his time. Simplifying for the sake of not overcomplicating, the Tanzimat, the decline of Ottomans and the Westernization that forced, you know, that followed, created um, conflicts in what first was essentially a traditional Islamic society. How to reconcile Islam with these new modern ideas, what to preserve and what to sacrifice, what to trust in science and what to trust in religion or tradition. Skipping young Ottomans and plenty of intellectuals in the process, I am instantly going to the young Turk era, as this is the era that affects Ataturk the most. Now, during this time, contrary to this wildly spread, stereotypical black and white view of like, you know, progressive modernists and backward traditionalists, there were, you know, indeed late Ottoman intellectuals who believed that the Ottoman, you know, that the West was superior in terms of civilization and sometimes even in cultural aspects. However, they did not believe in a complete disconnection of the past to embrace the new. In other words, there was no black and white picture of, you know, a struggle between progressives who sought to break everything with the past and traditionalists who that sought to preserve everything without a large gray zone of intellectuals who had a, you know who had more mixed views on civilization and culture. Now even here you'll recognize the politicized nature of the issue as this rhetoric or stereotype is often strengthened by traditionalists who want to lump all progressives into the you know wannabe Westerners camp and progressives who want to lump everyone who does not agree with all this progress in you know the traditionalist camp. To elaborate more on the distinction of civilization and culture, we'll take Mehmet Yagutov's interpretation of civilization and culture, namely that according to him, civilization is based on objective truths, whereas culture is based on subjective ones. Please note that he considers both of them separately as contrary to the late Ottoman traditionalists and materialists. Now this is where we'll start to talk about the Ottoman ultra-progressives or materialists who did not see civilization and culture as separable from each other as opposed to Gukhalp and others and thus believed that the, for the Ottomans to embrace Western civilization it also had to embrace Western culture and spirituality. Now however one key aspect often overlooked here is that they were, you know, they were following not the various strands of Western philosophy or Western uh, materialist ideologies, but more specifically, were adhering to a German vulgar materialism. Is a philosophical viewpoint which holds that all positions regarding truth 
are established on the basis of logic, reason, and atheism, instead of religion, and authority, tradition, and dogma. So, vulgar materialismus was a term used to denote a materialist ideology that had a very reductionist view on science and religion flavored with social Darwinism. To take Haniolo's description of the ideology, a vulgarized version of the doctrine of materialism fused in popular notions of materialism, scientism, and Darwinism into a simplistic creed that repelled the role of science in society. The late Ottoman version of this materialism was a further simplification of the German original and a medley of highly disparate ideas, the common denominator of which was the rejection of religion." End quote. So, to give a cheap example, using science, Ludwig Hübner, who was one of the key thinkers worshipped by late Ottoman materialists, would argue how women, blacks, and poorer folk were less intelligent because of the size of their skull. Again, this is not to say that you know, the late Ottoman materialists were against women or against blacks or something like that, but it's precisely about you know, this extremely over-reliance on science and this extremely reductionist view of science. The next point would be, for example, uh, the oversimplifying everything to religion and atheism. Basically, if a society is successful, it is because it is against religion, if it is unsuccessful, it is thanks to religion. Similarly to the, you know, in the opposite sense, it is like, if you win a battle, it is thanks to God, if you lose it, it is a punishment of God. It's basically the same, just in the opposite manner. Now, an important point to make here is that this trend of thinking, while criticized and attacked into irrelevance in Europe, with perhaps the exception of Russia, it became the most popular ideology in the late Ottoman Empire, and formed the philosophical basis of the Turkish Republic. So to repeat, the second rank Western ideology that failed to break through in the West managed to conquer the minds of the late Ottoman and eventually Republican elites. So this is actually something that in uh, Turkish literature is often known as you know the wrong Westernization. Now, why you might wonder, well, one explanation of how it managed to spread so quickly in the Ottoman Empire, while it was refuted in the West, according to Serdar Poyras at least, is that the other Western philosophical thoughts were too sophisticated for the late Ottoman intellectuals, hence they were drawn more to this, you know, more simplistic philosophy, which they simplified even more. Again, this is not to say that sophisticated attacks on religion from French writers weren't read However, they did not have a profound influence on late Ottoman intellectuals as the German vulgarist uh, materialist did. Now, having given you a short introduction on the conflict of modernists in the late Ottoman era, the question now becomes to which, you know, to which camp did Atatürk belong? Did he belong to the camp that sought to preserve the Turkish culture while westernizing its civilization? Or did he belong to the Ottoman materialists who that sought not only to impose Western civilization, but also to disconnect Turkey from any religious roots and make it more culturally more Western. Now, the answer to this can be both found in his reforms and quotes. And one of the most striking reforms that he did was obviously in his early uh, political career that he abolished the Islamic Caliphate and replaced it with Diyanet. Now, be aware that there is a misconception of Turkey being founded as a secular republic. Turkey was certainly not founded as such, but was rather founded as a republic adhering to laicite, which meaning that unlike in secular, secular countries where the church and state are separated from each other, here in Turkey uh, the state actually controls the mosque, I should say. Now Ataturk likely took this idea from Abdullah Cevdet and this is actually quite interesting because Abdullah Cevdet was a late Ottoman intellectual who encrypted his materialist ideology in an Islamic package to make it presentable for the common people. What is interesting though about him is that despite his alleged collaboration with the British during the War of Independence and how Ataturk treated collaborators, Ataturk actually protected him and considered him even a teacher. For example, Ataturk namely once told him that Doctor, until now you have written about many things. Now we may bring them to realization. 
and he was even promised a government post which was dropped after you know Abdullah that proposed to support the migration of German, Hungarian and Italian men to Turkey so they could impregnate Turkish women and thus strengthen the Turkish race or make it more European is also another sign of the you know vulgar materialism that was you know supported during that era. This is also why his establishment of Diyanet should not be considered you know, pro-Islamic per se, as the political goal was not to solely serve Sunni Muslims, but rather to mix Islamic theology with you know vulgar materialism. Basically, Atatürk repressed all the religious clergy and created his own Muslim clergy that would serve to attack other strands of Islam as basically not being Islamic enough. Another often used argument to make Atatürk at least be seen as a nominal Muslim is that he did consider Islam at least to be part of the Turkish national culture. The discrimination of Christians, migration policies enacted during his reign, and the population transfer which forced Turkish-speaking Christians to Greece in exchange for non-Turkic-speaking Muslims are often arguments used to support this thesis. However, as again, you know, again, this should not be considered as pro-Islamic, as we'll see later in the video. His brand of nationalism, compared to the previous and later brands of Turkish nationalism, is explicitly sought to minimize, if not deny, the 900 years of Turco-Islamic history. Not to mention that these policies were meant to homogenize uh, Turkey and get rid of the Ottoman cosmopolitan nature, not specifically to make Turkey more Islamic. So another controversial reform of his was probably his alphabet change, where he changed the alphabet from the Arabo-Persian one to the Latin one. This is often justified on linguistic grounds, which I won't go in depth about as the primary goal was certainly political. First, to obviously disconnect the Turkish people with the Oriental nations and connect it with the West, and secondly, so he could reform Turkish nationalism and refabricate Turkish history. So, whereas the earliest forms of Turkish nationalism and pluralism were explicitly anti racialist and often included Islam and Turkic folk tales, uh, Atatürk's Turkish nationalism was, you know, became quickly racialistic to keep it in line with the scientism that he promoted and as such he denied any metaphysical connotation to nationalism. Uh, for this, obviously, racial anthropology was used, um, which was obviously popular in, in that era. Um, and this was used to demolish the idea that Turks were an Asiatic people or herdsmen or, you know, some kind of typical Turco-Mongolian raiders. And instead, a new history was promoted that made Turks the racial ancestors of the human civilizations, specifically of the you know European civilization so Turks were now not positioned anymore as a yellow race as an Asiatic people so to speak but rather as a European or white race and especially you know specifically um, talking about the Alpine race meanwhile Islam obviously was being diminished to a simple footnote if not completely ignored again here we see we clearly see again how Atatürk tried to make the Turks a new in Western people or in European people in terms of not only civilization but also in terms of culture and we need to notice another indirect attack on Islam. So however diminishing Islamic influences and Europeanizing Turkish culture didn't stick to those reforms either. For example the history of the Rumi calendar which was used by the Ottomans was dropped and replaced not with the pre-Islamic Turkic calendar this is actually a point that I want to make, is like, uh, when it comes to Atatürk's cultural changes, he did not look to Central Asia or some kind of pre-Islamic Turkey culture. I mean, certainly he did when it came to you know, giving the Turks surnames, which had to be explicitly Turkic, or when it came to, you know, changing the language, which had to be, you know, Turkified. But other than that, that that's the only thing that it, uh, you know, became like, so to speak, Turkey. Other than that, all the reforms were meant to, you know, make Turkey culturally more European. So um, the calendar was actually replaced by the Christian Gregorian one. Uh, similarly, the Izani, the Islamic way of reckoning the time was replaced for the Western one. And finally, the weekly holiday was changed from the Islamic Friday to the Christian Sunday. So. Um, 
On top of that, you know, even when it comes to music, even expressions of the traditional Oriental ala Turka music was even repressed for two years, while the Turkish state continuously attempted to popularize Western composers for the Turkish public. As you can observe, I mean, like, it really becomes hard to argue that Atatürk was merely against the theocratic or backward Islam and, you know, promoted some kind of protestant or enlightened or modern Islam, as policies as these were clearly meant to culturally detach Turks from Islam and connect it culturally to Europe. And now we will also, you know, read a little bit about Atatürk's personal writings and sayings to, you know, finally, uh, you know, demolish the idea that Atatürk was simply for a modern Islam. However, before we start to talk about Atatürk's personal quotations on Islam, I'd like to make clear that a lot of quotes that you'll read on, uh, you know, read about Atatürk on Islam are like fake. For example, he has like a quote that says, if one day my words are against science, choose science, there is no source for that. The other two ones are actually from two biographies that are quite unreliable. And the last one is somewhat re reliable. It's the I have no religion and at times I wish all religions at the bottom of the sea. It comes from a Grace Ellison's meeting with Ottoturk in 1928. However, her book is also filled with inconsistencies. So it's a little bit uh, doubtful to trust her word on it as well. That said, there are certainly some trustworthy sources of his opinion on the Islamic religion. In his book, for example, Civics for the Citizen, he undeniably promotes a view, or rather an Orientalist view of Islam as a tool of Arab imperialism that polluted the purity of the Turkish culture or the Turkish nation. Now, just to be clear, this is just a part of the text, but the rest of the text basically boils down to the same thing. And this is actually quite ironic, but, you know, quite ironic if not tragic. But this is also why today you'll often see westernized Turks accuse their more conservative counterparts of being assimilated into the Arab culture and having lost their, you know, Turkish identity, while they themselves won't see their Turkish identity under threat when it comes to, you know, foreign cultural influences. From the West. Similarly, in another indirect attack on Islam, he also argues that the moral system of the Turks did not come from books, in other words, the Islamic scriptures, but was merely national. In other words, this was in line with the modernity promoted during this era, in which the state, in which the nation state rather, I should say, had to fill in the vacuum left behind by religion. However, Atatürk's disdain towards Islam or the Arabic culture was not only seen in his quotations and reforms. In the 1930s, for example, he also dropped his first name Mustafa and changed his second name Kamal, which comes from Arabic, to Kamal, allegedly meaning fortress in Old Turkic. As a side note, less known about Turks and their names is that Turks often tend to have Arabic Islamic first names while having explicitly Turkic last names. As when the surname, name, surname law was adopted, Turks had to take purely Turkic last names, while first names were still allowed to freely choose from. Aside from that, there is also the story that explains the reasoning for Atatürk to translate the Quran into Turkish. According to Qasim Karabekir, a close soldier turned into a political rival of him, Atatürk translated the Quran into Turkish so that the sons of the Turks, his words, would not be fooled anymore by that son of the Arabs, referring to the prophet here. While at first I remained skeptical whether this was true and not just some blackmailing on Karabekir's part, the fact that Atatürk expressed similar opinions to the American diplomat Charles Sherrill in 1932 makes this story closer to the truth than I initially thought it to be. As to finally finish the puzzle that basically confirms that Atatürk was absolutely no Muslim and not even you know, religious at all, at best he was an agnostic or an atheist. Um, the last evidence is from his voice recording from 1937 at the Jehebe Congress, where he publicly, de publicly declares that um, you know his inspirations did not come from the books that which people believe came down from above the heavens but from life itself, referring here to science and the books that fell from the heaven obviously refer to, you know, the Abrahamic religions or all the religions globally.
At the start of the video, I explicitly mentioned that Atatürk should be seen as a product of his time. Being first a soldier, then a politician, he rarely cared too much about political ideology and took whatever was popular around him. Hence, while today people might be disgusted by the racialism or the social Darwinistic rhetoric in his era, one should also remind himself that this was the typical way of thinking back then. Nor should his aversion for Oriental cultures or Islam be specifically attributed to him. As a young kid, he grew up in a decaying empire, observing the West conquer the world through force, while his parents were still picking fights whether to give him a secular or a religious education. Just like politics is often about action and reaction, his excessive desire to make Turkey modern should be also seen as a reaction to the excessively orthodox mentality of the population he sought to transform. Now, the sources will be added in this description and personal attacks in the comment section will be deleted. Constructive criticism on the video is always welcome, but always keep it civil.